are the opportunities? We've addressed strength, we've addressed weaknesses. What are the opportunities the nation has today in nation building with 1.2 billion people? See, India is a… this… this nation is a tremendous opportunity, a possibility. This is something that anybody who looks at this nation with closely enough can clearly see here. Rest of the world clearly sees that, that this is a nation of tremendous possibility. But what we need to understand is, between a possibility and a reality, there is a distance. Do you have the courage, the commitment and the conviction to walk the distance? That's always the question. Definitely it's a great possibility, we are sitting on the threshold. But do not underestimate our ability to goof things up. <laughs> I am not being pessimistic. I am the last person to be pessimistic about anything. But I know our ability to goof things. I see it every day. The way they drive on the street, the way they do things, the way everything is made. We have a phenomenal ability to goof up things because we are too much genius with very little organization. Yes, everybody thinks he's a genius. If you go sit in a tea shop in a street side in a rural, rural India, no, 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 I'm not talking politics. <laughs> if you sit in a tea shop in somewhere rural India's street side, because I've driven across the country, I've sat in dabas and tea shops so much. I've ridden a crisscrossed India on my motorcycle, so I lived in dabas and tea shops all the time. So, uh, you will see the guy who's making the tea there, he will be telling how Tendulkar should have made the right shot, <laughs> you know, how he… you know how his technique is not good, he's doing the wrong or, approach. Or Bishan Bedi sitting here, how she… he could have bowled. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> these kind of things. He will be talking about how the Prime Minister should have run the country differently. Only problem with him is he does not know how to make good tea <laughs> okay. So, this is a problem we are… Uh, we are too exuberant. A society like this is generally considered a high context society. We are too much context, not enough content. It's a very beautiful way to exist on one level, but if we do not organize, if we do not focus this natural exuberance of the people, a certain intelligence which is freewheeling intelligence, you will have uh, a very… a chaotic situation which seems to be going somewhere but not going anywhere. It's like a whirlwind making its own rounds. So it needs a little forceful engagement of pushing it in a certain direction. Uh, a little authority to push it, people don't understand what powers India. It's far powered by itself, it's just like a whirlwind. But you must be able to direct it in the direction that you want it to go, that needs a little bit of authority. But we picked up all kinds of fancy ideas, we don't like authority, you know. We don't like any kind of authority. We would like to go all over the place. Just see, just uh, the driving on the street is a clear demo. I'm not talking about authoritarianism, but a certain authority which organizes this whirlwind of chaos is needed for this country to push it in one direction, otherwise we'll keep going round and round. We come… see, we've been th sitting on a threshold. For me, the economic development that everybody is talking about, I am not thinking about how you can transform your life from Maruti to Mercedes, that doesn't matter to me. I'm not against cars, I like that <laughs> but <laughs> that is not the thing. There are over six hundred million people. Today night, after this is over, when we go wherever we go, the table at which we sit, there will be a choice of dinner that you and me can choose. There are six hundred million people who have no such choice tonight. The child who has to go to school tomorrow, he is not eating what is necessary for him to go and remember who is Mahatma Gandhi's wife. He doesn't care a damn because he is not eaten right. The woman the, who carries a, a child in her womb doesn't have the necessary nourishment to bring out something that's worthwhile. Now, this can change in next five to eight years' time if we handle things right. And it matters that we handle this right.
So you really combine the opportunity with the threat. Because the same population, the same energy, if goofed up, as you yes. said, could be a threat. Of is there any other threat other than this? See, this is the biggest threat for India. This also happened in the economic forum. Our people, particularly the corporate and also the ministers were… You know, everywhere you hear this, I, I think everybody is repeating this chant. We are the youngest nation in the world, we are the youngest nation in the world. I sat through this and I was amazed why everybody is gloating about we are the youngest nation. So I asked them, what happened to the old people? <laughs> they said, what? No, no, we are the youngest nation. I said, that's okay, but what happened to the old people? Yeah. I want you to know in India, in India nobody gets old. People die young. That's why we are the youngest nation in the world. <laughs> yes, it is a tragedy that we don't have old people. But this tragedy can be turned into a tremendous possibility right now because compared to the rest of the world, we are a youthful nation, we have the opportunity to power ourselves into well-being. But we must understand why we are the youngest nation. Suppose uh, we are saying right now sixty percent of the population is below thirty and we are very proud. Tomorrow you find sixty percent of the population is below fifteen. Something wrong has happened or no? Why are we not looking at it? We have not run it properly. Why don't we see people are not growing old, people are not living… My great-grandmother lived to be one, one, three. Nobody is living like that. Everybody is dying in their fifties and sixties or even less. So we are… we have the synergy of youth right now. Though our poets are elegizing many things about the country, I want you to understand for 1.25 billion people, you neither have the land, nor mountains, nor forests, nor rivers, nor even a piece of sky for 1.25 billion people. If all of them have to live in decent housing, almost literally, you know, huge occupation will happen, there will be nothing left. The only reason why we seem to be managing is because they're living like cattle packed up in one room, twelve, twelve people are sleeping, we're managing. If every one of them has to have a decent bedroom, you won't have place. So only thing that you have is people. If you have this population educated, focused, balanced and inspired, we are a miracle. If you leave them uneducated, unfocused, uninspired, unskilled, we are the biggest disaster waiting. Do we need money for this? We have the money. We have the money, we have not had a determined leadership. What has been lacking is leadership because I'm… I'm not uh, somebody who takes any political stance but I'm just looking back, I'm seeing. Leave the first twenty-five years after independence. They did whatever best they could do with little that they had and it's a heady times, okay? But after the passing of Jawaharlal Nehru, we've not really had a prime minister. In the sense, somebody always… except that Lal Bahadur Shastri for a short period and maybe Narasimha Rao for a little period which was… government was tottering all the time. Rest of the time, somebody becomes a prime minister only because somebody dies and Indian emotion like a cinema it overtakes everybody. And somebody's daughter, somebody's son, somebody's somebody becomes the prime minister. We've never really had someone who has roots in the nation, who knows what this country is and who's burning with aspiration to make this nation something. We've never had that. It's only by default that people have become prime ministers in this country. But don't the leaders come from within the community, within the people? No, no, I'm saying Prime ministers happen only because somebody no, died. But you also have certain states. We're talking about even state governance. We're not only talking about central governance. Yes, but… Uh, India has twenty-nine states today. It's state governance. Look what's happening with Uttar Pradesh today. Uttar Pradesh, what is happening? It's a leadership which was elected two and a half years ago with overwhelming acceptance. What happened? It's… it come from within. But what's gone wrong? What's… what is the present state? I'm not saying gone wrong or right. So haven't people… aren't people responsible for it? No, no, we… we are a democracy in paper. But our mindset is essentially feudalistic because even… I'm saying even among the elite and educated, suppose you do well tomorrow, uh, suppose our present prime minister does really well tomorrow, people will cry, I wish we had a son. <laughs> you understand? People will cry, I, we wish he had a son. Because when he goes, his son could become the prime minister. 
I'm saying in our mindset we are still feudalistic. So when you are feudalistic, things are run in a certain way. What essentially it means is being feudalistic or democratic is, feudalistic means who your father was matters. Democracy means I don't care a damn who your father was, I don't want to know. This is why I said Mahatma Gandhi's wife, I don't want to know who she is, I don't want to know who Mahatma Gandhi's father is. We bow down to him for who he is and that's all that matters to us. And that's how it should be in a democratic nation. We care who you are, we don't care who your father was. You may care who your father was, I don't care who your father was. I only care who you are. <laughs>